The Health Fix Podcast teaches you how to take charge of your health naturally by giving you the information you need to elevate your health. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause. Today, I have Christine Forner on the line. She is, oh my gosh, what can I say? She's got a lot of great background here, but in particular, she is a social worker at heart. She has a bachelor's and a master's in social work, and we're going to be diving into her deep passion of talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, and traumatic disassociation. And for a lot of you out there that might be thinking, what in the heck is traumatic disassociation? Don't worry, by the end of this, we will have covered it all for you and you will be well on your way to knowing a lot more about this and if you might be doing this yourself. So Christine, welcome to The Health Fix. Thank you very much. It's just very wonderful to be here. Well, I want to hear a little bit about your story because we all have stories as to how we get into the careers that we jump into. And in your case, I saw a little bit of some early training in sensory motor psychotherapy and that exposure allowed you to kind of recognize some of your own trauma and move you forward into this career. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, actually, um, I've been in the business one way or another since I was 16. Wow. So I started working on a teen um, crisis line when I was 16 years old. And I think back now and I, it surprises me because it was a very serious crisis line. There was a lot of suicide calls that I was dealing with very early at a very young age and it didn't seem to bother me. Wow. Um, I seemed to be able to keep my cool. I was able to help a lot of people. And then I, I went and got a diploma right after high school. Um, I also, um, 10 years, I got a degree in women's studies. And then uh, after having children, I got my bachelor's in social work and my master's in social work. But my first job uh, in my diploma was working at a sexual assault center as a public educator. And I ended up in that field because of the option, I was very young at the time, I was 18, 19 years old. I didn't really relate or want to work with seniors. And that was the other option of the practicum. So I didn't want to work with sexual assault. I didn't want to work with seniors, but the sexual assault had a public education component where I was working with youths. So that's the career. That's where that happened. And um, I remember first learning about it and being very viscerally ill myself, like, like learning about sexual assault and learning about what happens. Um, it was very shocking, but it, it's been where I've been since I was 18, 19 years old professionally. I also worked in, after I graduated with my women's studies degree, I worked in a um, shelter for domestic violence. It was the only shelter um, that was both addressing male and female survivors of domestic violence. And it, it's still today one of the only places that actually accepts male people as well versus female people, but male genders. Um, it, it, it was a it was an accident the the people who created the shelter didn't realize that it's it's a fairly gendered experience um so it was very interesting to work with and be able to experience what domestic violence is like how men experience domestic violence versus how women experience domestic violence um i was there for a couple of years and i had a child and and really i think having my child is the thing that profoundly changed my life profoundly changed um, how I experienced myself and profoundly changed how I experienced the world. And after having my son, I wasn't able to work at the women's shelter much more because I would see these children and way over identified. Like it would, it would, my mama juices were very, very strong. And it was very, very difficult to be seeing these, these children who had these big saucer eyes who were disconnected from the world, who were terrified and um, not really being able to do much to change. So even before I should, um, this was a long time ago, because I've been in the business for about 30 years now, you probably couldn't get away with what I got away with today. But I started handing out applications and um, I was hired at it as a, it's a community-based organization. It was a privately run community-based organization that specialized in long-term therapy for women only. It was low fee. Um, I really, I was making very little money back then, but all of my clients were experiencing a great deal of complex trauma and dissociation. And one of my very first clients had multiplicity. She had a dissociative identity disorder. And because I hadn't gone through um, a master's or a counseling program or psychology or psychiatry, 
I didn't know there was so much controversy around it. I listened to the person, the women that were working there mentored me. I read books and the very first book I wrote was uh, read about this kind of complex trauma was a, by a gentleman may, named Dr. Colin Ross. And I read his book like it was um, a novel. It was like one of the, it's still to this day, one of the few textbooks that I've actually read from cover to cover, honestly. Um, and and under, like just hearing the stories, I didn't question the sanity or insanity of these people's, women's experiences. Um, they really taught me how they needed to be cared for. And that has seriously impacted the rest of my career. I ended up going back to school and then I ended up really specializing. And, and during this time, I got involved with an organization called the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, which is chock full of some of the most um, amazing, open-minded, heartfelt, brilliant human beings that I've ever met in my life. And, and the, the work that they are doing and have done for the last 40 years, they look in the dark corners where many other people won't look. They, they have for almost 40 years seen the realities of complex trauma, seen the realities of sex trafficking, seen the realities of organized abuse, seen the realities of incest. And it's one of the few organizations that, that even, even today we have the Me Too movement, the Me Too movement still kind of excludes incest survivors. And uh, the ISSTD, it's a common thing to talk about these things. Because as a therapist that I've been doing this for a long, long time now, it's very, 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 very common. And, and a lot of people don't have, like, this isn't stuff that gets trained about. This isn't stuff that gets talked about in schools. This level of, of systematic or, and or intergenerational and or personal violence is not really spoken of. Um, as a matter of fact, there's lots of messages that we're not supposed to talk about it. There's lots of messages that it gets, that it's part of insanity rather than a truthful thing that a lot of people experience. So in those 20 years, I realized that what I was, I was trying to do the best that I could, I started taking my own therapy. And so I, I got um, EMDR training, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that was okay. I'm not, I don't think I'm very good at it. I, I, I understand it well enough that I've been part of, you know, um, writing a, a manual about it and, and been part of a group to train, teach people how to work with dissociation and EMDR. But um, what really seemed to have worked for me was a, a form of meditation that is much more guided than traditional mindfulness-based meditations. And so when I started introducing, I started experiencing the meditation myself, it really led to this level of embodiment. And then I went to a, a class that Bessel van der Kolk was running and he said, you need to get sensory motor or somatic experiencing. You need to get neural feedback training and you need to do this and you need to do that. So I marched out and sensory motor was the closest training available to me up in here in Canada. I didn't really know what I was getting into, but it has profoundly changed. You know, they, they say EMDR changes your practice. Sensory motor changes your life. Sensory motor teaches you about how to be embodied, how to, with enough scaffolding, go to the darkest, saddest, frightened, alone, guilted, guilt-ridden, shamed places inside of us with safety. And it ties in really well with meditation, except this is, this is um, territory that most complex trauma survivors um, have very a great deal of difficulty going towards because a lot of what we really feel and what we really know and what we're experiencing that is painful becomes unconscious to us. It, it gets pushed down in a dissociative way and, and we kind of figure out, we kind of know today why that is. Um, dissociation is one of the most underfunded, understudied areas of mental health. Most of the information that we have in the research that we have over the last 30, 40 years, it's privately funded. We have never gotten any large, huge, I think there's one woman in Harvard who just recently got a huge uh, grant and that's the first time that has ever happened. So the information and the research that we have is being done like literally blood, sweat and tears by researchers all over the world who really have been able to see this aspect of humanity clearly and trying to, to help train people on how to work with this, how to look at this in a way that makes sense, and how to 
really stop vilifying it. Absolutely. I, I think that's huge note that there's not a lot of research because what we hear about is what's usually researched. And then unfortunately, we usually don't care about the research until 10 years after the research is, is completed. And so in this case, talking about disassociation and, and the connection with overall health and connection with the freeze mode is, is what I want to kind of dive into. But before yeah. we get into that, let's tell folks a little bit about what disassociation is and how they might experience it in their own life if they're wondering like hmm could this be how i'm ex manifesting my trauma or could, how i'm experiencing my trauma for that matter yeah sure i think most people are pretty familiar with ptsd but a lot of people think that it's it's uh, the sole territory of, of combat vets or, or um, accident survivors ptsd really is a flight system it's part of our active defense system um, so us human beings, we kind of have, it's not really like this anymore, but it's a good way to explain it. it. It's not really true to the science of it, but we have like these three main brain structures. We have our bottom base brain structures, which is our defensive system. This is our brainstem and our limbic system. These brain systems are pretty much fully formed at birth. Then we have that prefrontal cortex, which grows, starts to grow at three and kind of finishes near 20. And then we have the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is this other brain structure that not very many people talk about, understand, or, or add into this language. But that ventral medial prefrontal cortex, that is our, our supercharged relational brain that is part that gets activated when we do contemplative or mindfulness or, or um internal examination kind of work and that ventral medial prefrontal cortex is the brain structure that's really designed to manage the lower brain structures the prefront the the prefrontal cortex which is the thinking brain so really a way to look at it is you have your reactive brain your your the, the brain that runs the body, runs the unconscious information, runs the heartbeats and the blood pressures and the temperature and and really that's our hardware it's it's very standard with all human beings and then we have our prefrontal cortex which is our software that is very dependent on the environment and it is dependent upon um everything that grows in that prefrontal cortex is interpreted through our caregivers through our environment and then you have the ventral medial prefrontal cortex which is the super relational brain it's almost like the parenting brain and that is the brain that grows if we have mindful present parents. It doesn't grow if we don't. So, so when we're talking about these defenses of PTSD, complex PTSD, developmental traumas, that kind of stuff, really it, it's the back brain structures that, that begin to drive the train and they're really in charge of our fight, flight, freeze, tonic immobility and fawning. So we have our active defenses that um, help us get away from danger or move towards safety. So they involve movement, action. That is your uh, fight, your flight, um, even a hard freeze. A lot of people, if they ever experience a feeling of being invisible or they want to be invisible or their eyes are really big and they can't speak, their throat is closing up, that's likely they're in a hard state of freeze. Really what it is, is that the body wants to pretend or be invisible so predation or predators don't get us. Um, the active defense is running away from the predator, which is better than, than being close to the predator. Um, and then if that doesn't work, fighting kicks in. And each of these states have their own internal choreography. So for example, if we're moving into a hard freeze, all the muscles freeze, there's tension in the body, there's, there's gonna be soreness or muscle tension everywhere. There's a certain amount of cognition that goes away. There's a certain amount of awareness that actually comes. So your hearing can become supercharged, seeing can become supercharged, but you don't really have agency over it because it is so primal and hardwired into us. If we go into a state of fight, this is, this is gonna sound familiar with a lot of people. So if you, if you meet somebody who's in a state of fight, they don't have internal awareness at that time. Because if you're fighting a tiger, having the thought like, oh my goodness, I'm fighting a tiger, is going to make you more vulnerable. So in those, when we're in fight, if you're fighting with someone and they're in a fight state, it is a autonomic, overpowering state that turns off the front brain that turns off our capacity to have agency and when we're in fight that notion of what am i doing here isn't working 
it's all external. They're they're a hundred percent focused on the outside. They're not focused on the inside. I'm sure this is going to start making sense when we talk about narcissists, right? They're all inward. They're not, and and they're lacking in empathy because empathy is going to kill you if you're having empathy to the tiger. And so people who are stuck in this narcissistic state is typically a small child in a state of fight who never got to develop beyond that. And they become a narcissist or a variety of something. So then we move into, um, so if those don't work and the tiger gets close to us and we end up in the tiger's mouth, we end up in these inactive defenses, but also our relations and how we relate to people get um, trans. Um, interpreted in our bodies as an inactive defense too because for for infants and children a lot of people um, if you have a baby right after the baby's born it's fairly common practice to put the baby on the tummy and the baby will start wiggling up trying to find the breast um, a lot of people assume that it's looking for food but if you think about it a lot of times the umbilical cord is either still attached or just recently being cut and that baby is floating around in a hundred percent liquid there's no way that tummy is empty enough to drive it. But bonding and our need to bond to our caregivers, an intense life and death bond is our first line of defense. And it's what human beings need more than anything else, especially in those early years. And if, if and so the human being, everything it does is tied into bonding. And if that bonding doesn't happen properly, then the, the child starts to experience, the infant starts to experience the need for bonding. And the feelings and the sensations that go with the need for bonding are, are same like the need for food, the need for sleep, the need for eating, the need for um, hydration. It becomes a physiological need that is painful and it is upsetting. Um, if that need doesn't get met, we will normalize it, but we have to anesthetize the pain in order to continue to stay as bonding as possible with our caregivers. And so the inactive defenses are for humans, not only to um, manage being in the tiger's mouth, but it's also there to manage lack of bond. Because human being, especially in infancy and early childhood, we need people more than we need food. And I know that's really bizarre for people to think, but that's, it's true. And, and we know that it's true because of how our brain structures are designed. We know that it's true by hundreds of thousands of studies that have shown that this is true. There is more truth to this than there is to a biomedical model, that, that this is a genetic problem. There's, there's not a lot of evidence to support the genes and chemical imbalance is the problem, but there's so much evidence. It's just that we start talking about child abuse. We start talking about lack of bonding. We start talking about trauma. And most people have a reaction inside of them to avoid it because it hurts. And so our inactive defense system is, is designed for two things. One, it's designed to let, make us play dead, but it's also designed to help us manage in relationships that um, where our first line of defense, which is other people, is not there. Because we, we don't just need people to keep us safe in those first three years, five years, 10 years of life. We need people to fill in the blanks because we don't come out understanding language. We don't un come out knowing what is what. It's 100% it's up to our parents to interpret, understand, to comprehend, to empathize, and to attune to that infant's internal world so that the parents can know the difference between hunger, thirst, sleep, entertainment, up-regulating, down-regulating, making that child be okay all the time. And so if, that, if there's a bump in that process, dissociation is the thing that comes in. Shame is heavily, um, and we know that dissociation, so, so when we start moving into these inactive defenses, the brain structure is very different than the active defenses. So when we move into this, these inactive defenses, it's either to turn everything off and play dead so that the predator doesn't realize that we are still alive, it's a last line of defense so that if the predator drops, you know, thinks that we are dead because a lot of predators enjoy a live prey, if, if, or they will go get their young, that's when we're supposed to interpret, that's when the body sort of can wake up again and, and move away. So playing dead is what we do to survive the unsurvivable. But when we dissociate, um, when we, our, our front brain actually becomes, it stays still quite active. Whereas when we're in fight, when, it, when we're in the active defenses, that front brain is inactive. But when we dissociate, the front brain is quite active. 
it's the, the lower brain structures, the thalamus and the insula that get turned off. So the insula will turn information off. So information coming up from the body gets cut off in the front brain. It's almost like it's going, where'd everybody go? Where'd everybody go? And it starts to overthink. Um, we, we have brain images where there is, you can see that somebody's in a state of tonic immobility, like frozen where nothing is happening in the brain. And then we have images where there's hyperactivity up in the brain. The other thing that happens when we dissociate that doesn't happen in our other line of defenses is that the thalamus scatters information on purpose. It disconnects things on purpose so that feeling and knowing are disconnected so that sensing and um, comprehending are disconnected. So the information is intentionally scattered. And the other thing that it does is it um, floods us with natural opioids and cannabinoids. So basically heroin and pot. And, and it, it is measurable. We've, we've measured it at somewhere between seven and 10 milligrams per um, dosage kind of thing. So I don't know if you've ever been on seven or 10 milligrams of morphine. No. You are higher than a kite. So when we dissociate as children, it's basically an anesthetic. It's a way of scattering information and eliminating information and eliminating knowing. So a book that I wrote about dissociation and mindfulness really describes these complete polar opposite and even rival brain um, activities. So that dissociation really is the opposite of mindfulness. It's about not knowing where mindfulness is about knowing. Um, and it, it, it's, it's way more common than people think because it is very closely related to um, attachment ruptures. It's really closely related, related to no bonding. So there's lots of people who have milder, quote unquote, milder dissociative disorders, a depersonalization and derealization where they kind of feel like they're stoned a little, like they feel like they're disconnected from themselves or disconnected from the world. Um, a lot of times it may come with ear ringing because the central nervous system is on fire at that point. And you can actually sometimes hear that central nervous system being inflamed because every time we move into our defenses, our central nervous system becomes inflamed and we know that autoimmune diseases, diseases are highly correlated with an inflamed central nervous system. Yeah. So, right. We know that we know that autoimmune diseases do come from chronic stress. And it could be this lifetime or your parents' lifetime because that software kind of can get transferred from one generation to the next. Um, so when we start moving in, we can have a, a dissociative disorder, otherwise um, not a, a unspecified dissociative disorder or otherwise specified dissociative disorder. This is not as severe as multiplicity or dissociative identity disorder, but there's still like, like they'll, they'll, we lose our agency. The more you go down the road of, of dissociation, the less agency you have over yourself. So you can have thoughts and reactions, but you have no agency over them. And because of the thalamus cutting everything off or separating everything, it, it tends to go along lines of emotions. And then if this is happening from infancy onward, which is where a lot of these things come from, um, the human system doesn't know how to integrate itself. It doesn't know how to um, go from state to state to state because children are in states, right? That this, when you see kids, they can go from being really angry to really happy in seconds is because they move from one state to another. Adults don't do this. We're more gradual. We're more um, whole. We're more embodied. Our, our brains have had a chance to fill in the blanks with different contexts and different meanings. So we, for us, our moods are a little more... Um, grayer maybe is a word or a little more diffused is probably a better word but for children they their states are quite separate as and their states go from feeling to feeling to to feeling and feeling is different than emotion a, a feeling is the sensory felt feeling inside the emotion is what we label it and if um, parents get the labeling wrong we'll get the labeling wrong so this is why sensory motor is such a brilliant therapy because it teaches you how to put the sensation inside your body with the right feeling and the correct words because all feelings really are is a request for something. They're a very vital part of being human. And when we dissociate, these things get disconnected from each other. But they still, we all, we have to grow a sense of self. It's part of our hardware. 
And so these emotions that are separated develop a sense of self. And sometimes it's a little bit of a sense of self and sometimes it's a really big sense of self. And so when we start moving into multiplicity or dissociative identity disorder, this is what's happened from the beginning. And we also know there's a, there's a couple studies that are showing time and again that people with DID tend to be people who have no availability of a caregiver. So it's both parents that are unavailable, either through um, and typically through their own trauma or own trauma ties behavior. And then you, you take in the, the other factor of us needing to bond. We bond with anything and everything because that's our primary directive. That is in everything that we do for us humans. Because if you think about what life was like for us 100,000 years ago or 200,000, years ago or 300,000 years ago, the more human we became, the more vulnerable we came to the elements, right? So the things back in Africa, there was lots of things that like to eat us. And we know this by looking at re-examining our, the fossils we have found of human um, hominids. They're all, they've all been predated by birds, by crocodiles, by um, lions, cheetahs, hyenas, various dogs. There was lots of things. And if you think about this, right? So you have a lion looking at a group of humans and a lion looking at a group of zebras, who are they gonna go for? The one that can kick and run fast or the one that is slow, can't see in the dark, has dulled senses, has no claws, has no teeth. Um, compared to any other mammal who has, who's really weak, that muscle got, we left that muscle strength a long time ago, like millions of years ago. Uh, we exchanged muscle strength for gut digestion and a bigger brain. Um, so for us humans, we were the junk food of Africa. <laughs> we really were. I think then the only thing that kept us safe was large groups of people, like 150 people. And we were taken care of by more than one adult. We were probably taken care of by four or five adults. And every adult and every other human we walked into would have been safe. Because it makes no sense to have um, one group sticking out. That, that person would have been eaten. One group rejected, that would have been eaten. And, and it would have threatened the whole entire 150. So we are really designed to bond and, and to be safe with each other. And we're not right now. So dissociation is common. I can imagine that just listening to what you're saying, like even what's going on with the pandemic now, any children that are growing up in this world of, of mass, I heard, heard about a study this morning on the news that was released in terms of baby's development and not seeing our facial expressions um, because of mask wearing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this, yeah. this is going to have some, some huge impacts on the kiddos right now. And, and wow. Phones. Phones and the lack of presence with the parents. Um, we, we know that the front brain structure, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the, and the default mode network and quite, there's, but basically the highest form of our humanity or the highest achievement, developmental achievement that we have is something that is produced by doing mindfulness or having securely attached parents. Mm -hmm. So people who are securely attached and people who uh, practice a lot of mindfulness, they share the same qualities. And it, it is the front brain structure being the most dominant brain structure. And that brain structure is designed to regulate our fear. It's designed to regulate our emotions. And, and what we mean by regulating emotions is not letting, not having them, but having them and still staying in your window of tolerance, still staying in the front. So you're having this profound grief surrounded in safety. And, and I don't know very many people who really have been able to experience 100% vulnerability along with 100% safety besides people who are securely attached. And we know that it's not that common. Yeah, yeah. Relationships yeah. are messed up. We've got divorces. We have, you yeah. know, a lot of people who do not even speak to their parents at, at yeah. the stage of the game. And I can yeah. imagine that that also creates some serious issues going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, we're not taught in schools. We're not taught in med schools. We're not taught in social work schools or psychology schools that the reason why so much of this stuff is going on is because uh, we need each other. We need each other so much. And dissociation is the byproduct of this. That's that's very interesting. That's super interesting. And it makes sense why, you know, we're looking for our own little tribes. We're looking, you know, or big tribes, however it may be in that need to connect and, and whatever yeah. way someone finds that. But there's a warning, right? So if you dissociate 
-hmm. it fundamentally means that your inner world is riddled with pain. Mm. And it fundamentally means that you were not taught how to care for yourself because no one cared for you. And so when we start moving into healing and treating this, most modalities do not incorporate this. They don't understand it. They don't add it, right? So if your body is telling you to stay still, to do nothing, to hide, to play dead, and you go see a therapist or anybody, and they're telling you behaviorally or cognitively that you need to get up and that you need to do things and that you need to, you need to achieve, 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 do, 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 you can very easily make that person dissociate more and more and more and more as that feeling of threat is coming up. The other thing we need to understand is that when you start to care for somebody, right? So your injury gets covered with a dissociative barrier. Okay. When we care for people, that dissociative barrier goes away. What's here under that dissociative barrier? It is a whole bunch of pain that you to this date cannot tolerate and a bunch of information bonding wise that you can't know. And if you go too fast, which a lot of the modalities like sensory motor is a very powerful modality, but EMDR, um, almost anything that, that is demanding someone to move quickly, yeah. you're going to be taking off that protective barrier. And there's no foundation underneath for that pain or suffering. There's no place for it to be cared for, to be tended to, to be soothed, to be assured, to be reassured, right? So it is just, it's like ripping off this bandaid and leaving this wide open gaping wound and being able to do nothing about it, right? Remember when I mentioned that that prefrontal cortex, the ventral pineal prefrontal cortex is hyper per active right so you take the barrier and so that even taking three breaths can make the insula work properly and that person then gets flooded with all their pain and suffering and they don't know how to put it back in the box except for to dissociate so this is why it is very tricky to heal because we're so um, goal oriented or 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 task driven and then a lot of clients get get labeled as um being bad at therapy and a lot of people experience failure after failure after failure with a therapy and they think that it's them and it's not them it's that the the practitioners aren't taught about this it is that the clinicians the doctors the medical doctors are actually taught things that go against this and hurt this um, and we don't we don't do really psychodynamic we don't teach people to do this long relational developing a relationship with your client first and how to do a safe relationship with the client first because it is that safety that is the buffer to all the pain and suffering and if you're seeing somebody for 10 or 8 or 10 sessions that's never going to happen and so they, they they walk around thinking that they're the problem when they're not the problem they're acting very very understandably if we learn to look at this from a less misogynistic patriarchal view of of what a human being is i think you bring up a very good point here because one of the things that you know and i've had some people in the podcast who i've interviewed about talking about childhood trauma and there's a lot of online courses and things of that nature these days and it does bring up some concern for me because like you said we're opening up this wound and and we have these people saying they can help with your childhood trauma in six to eight months and and 12 week programs and i'm going this no. is some people have 50 60 years of this yeah what, what do we do so what are you suggesting in terms of i think for for just kind of helping folks to kind of know like what if you want to work on your disassociations how much on and i know we can't give like a, a baseline but i mean what should folks be looking for in terms of keywords that people are saying that show that they understand that this isn't going to be six 12 week program this is yeah. years but yeah. also tell us a little bit because i wanted to talk about your creative meditation for disassociative disorders because this is something that i've never heard of before and you mm -hmm. created this, so I, I, I want to hear about that. But, but yes, tell us how many years on average, you know, realistically, how many years are we talking about? Because I think a lot of people suspect yeah. that they could fix their issues in, in, in a lot of these 12-week online. Yeah, programs, and, and you think about, right, so, so people with dissociative disorders, they don't get included in any studies. Mm -hmm. There's not one single study that, um, you know, all the studies that we have about pharmaceutical information, most people with dissociative disorders or complex trauma or childhood issues, they're, they're screened out of that um, test, right? So most of the 
pharmaceutical information that's being given to people is totally off-label use because people with complex trauma and childhood abuse are excluded from all studies because they're complicated. There's a lot of compl complex systems going on. So the pharmaceuticals won't work all that well and typically don't work all that well. Um, and then you have the, the typical therapy about cognitive behavioral therapy. There's no way that the mind, the thoughtful mind, which is only about maybe about 5% of our brain structure, it's not like it's, it's a small arm to the big machine. There is no way you can outthink your natural neurobiology. The, the mind is the software. It is 100% dependent on the hardware. And dissociation is in the hardware. And so um, typically things like depersonalization, derealization will probably take a couple of years. Getting into the more complex stuff, it can be three to five. And then getting into multiplicity, it's usually eight to 10, if not a lifetime, depending on, um, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you help someone heal who was so profoundly neglected in childhood that they have trouble eating because their body associates food with being poisonous because it was in rotten bottles. Yeah, that is so deep in the body and so painful that um, helping someone tolerate that kind of pain and building up a foundation can take a long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. saying the, the real amounts of time because I think we have a lot of folks out there that are seeing some of the folks online who work with, with different yeah. childhood and, and, and is being marketed as childhood trauma that I'm like, ooh, that's opening a whole- That's the key point, right? It's being marketed, yes. right? There's a lot of people in this trying to make a living and trying to make, um, like, you know, a lot of people are trying to make a name for themselves and trying to make a living. Um, a lot of people that I work with don't have and a lot of people really don't understand the profound injuries that this is it, it if you if you have mild to to severe dissociation um or even like childhood complex trauma and that kind of stuff you fundamentally don't know how to trust yourself or the world because there's information inside of you that you don't really know how to manage mm -hmm. um you know like i said when you're taking sensory motor you know, the first, the first level is uh, four weekends, long weekends over, mine was over a year long. There's only so many like falls, downs and car accidents that you can draw upon by level two, which is very relational and very um, developmental. You really start getting into your own stuff. And it's kind of shocking being in this business and realizing how much information you did not know about yourself. Um, and then I went on to be certified and it was during my certification that I finally was able to have enough tolerance to my own inner sensations and feelings that I could actually feel them and then make meaning of them. And that was a pretty painful, brutal thing. Like it's trauma with eyes wide open and you need to have a fair amount of, of um, scaffolding around yourself, of agency, of how to make yourself feel better on a regular basis before you can really see what happens. And it's not uncommon for childhood memories to be distorted for childhood um, thoughts, right? So take an example of someone who does experience something like incest. How you feel is hardware. Your body's reaction to that is hardware, right? So for a lot of children, it feels like they're in, a, in the tiger's mouth. And the first line of defense we have is people, right? So if the body is experiencing a felt feeling of being eaten, which it feels like when it's being sexually assaulted, it's gonna to go towards the nearest human being and that human being is a predator. There is no backup plan for that inside a human body, none. We have lots of backup plans for people dying. We have lots of backup plans for people being in tornadoes and, um, and our backup plan is people, right? So if we don't have people, the body is gonna to go towards people and then pull away and go towards and pull away. And in rapid succession, it's impossible for an infant or a child to put words and meaning and context to that. So it really does depend on the outside world to put words, meaning and context. And the perpetrator is the one that fills in the blanks. Yeah. And so the perpetrator is doing a whole bunch of other things that trying to convince themselves that what they're doing isn't bad or after the pain and suffering of that child, they're, they're after they're feeding on the vulnerability because that, um, pain and suffering is actually doing something to their central nervous system. And it, it really, you know, it starts to question, is this all about power and control? And I, I'm not sure that it is. I think it, is, it has a lot more to do with 
um, trying to fix something that's very, 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 very broken. And it's so far from our history and our, in our bodies, because this has been going on for about six to 7,000 years that a lot of people don't have the instinct on how to help themselves feel better. And so this is complicated stuff, right? You're trying to take a relationship and help people learn to trust themselves and teach them how to profoundly care for every part of themselves. But once they figure that out, they become so magnificent and impervious almost. And you, 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 when you get to see a survivor fall in love with themselves, all of themselves, and they start to have compassion for who they were as a child, say, like, you know, talking about that inf incest survivor, when they start to realize it's normal for my body to feel this way, it's normal for me to react this way. It is supposed to be painful because this is painful, not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. And when you start to realize they become very loving and gentle and kind of themselves and it's providing care. And so this is another area that, that um, traditional psychology and traditional therapy is really, like, we're really in this, let's do these skills. And it's not really, let's do this task or that task. It's more of the skill of profound, intimate, moment to moment, day to day, second to second care. Am I hungry right now? What do I want to eat? Am I thirsty right now? What do I need to drink? Am I needing to move? Am I needing to soft? Am I needing to rest? Am I needing this? Am I needing that? That's a very intimate journey that, that a lot of people are missing right now because it's so painful in there because of what's happened. Wow. No, this is, I mean, this is something I see every day in my office on a daily basis, you know, working with patients one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if someone's listening to this and they're like, wow, I think I am disassociating and they're going, what can I do? Where can I find some help? How can they interact with you? How can they interact with someone, you know, say they're in the States, say they're in Calgary, because I believe you're in Calgary. Yes. And yeah. so how can, how can they find you or how can they get the help they need? Where should they be looking and what should, what should they be going after? Um, well, there's, there's actually quite a bit of material like written books. Most of the books though really do describe the experiences. They don't necessarily describe how to, how to put it all back together. Um, there's the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, which really is a profoundly unique organization to, to trauma because they have been dealing with this and looking at this for 40 years now. So other people will say that they're okay with, with dissociation, but they've only been working this and adding this into their menu of offerings in the last five to 10 years. And most of what they're offering is bit has been discovered by the field of trauma and dissociation. So one of the things you can do is you can go to the website, the ISSTD website and find a therapist. We do have therapists all over the country, all over the world who specialize in this kind of material. I would be cautious of walk, watching things on um, YouTube because there are some people, like most people who have severe dissociation, dissociation is about wanting to be hiding. It's, it's wanting to be invisible. It's wanting to not be there, not be seen. And so sometimes a lot of people who uh, actually probably have a different disorder that is more, or a different reaction, which is more active, like um, something that gets labeled as borderline, which I'm not a fan of, because borderline really is somebody who's mad, somebody who's angry and somebody who's scared, right? So fear drives that rage, but that's a, that's a relational injury. And they're looking for like, they're, it's like an attachment cry. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. People with dissociation are even beyond asking for help. So a lot of times they're, they're quite, um, um, they're fearful of asking for help. So a lot of the stuff you do see could be like if it's if it's um, survivor driven, there's some beautiful survivor driven organizations such as um, uh, Beauty After Bruises, I think is one of them. Um, the ISSTD does have some connection to some some survivor groups. Just be cautious of those survivor groups. Be very, very um, if it doesn't feel good to you, don't push through it don't push through anything because they, they get pushed through almost everything. Um, if you're, if you're in, if your therapist is introducing something that makes you feel uncomfortable or makes you feel upset and you have difficulty saying it, write a note and try and tell your therapist, um, trying to communicate as much as you can to that therapist that what they're doing is not okay with you. Can they try it in a different way? Because 
the biggest thing about working with dissociation is figuring out how to have a relationship with someone who's craving relationships, but terrified of relationships at the same time. Um, it is a very come here, go away kind of thing. So um, if you can, however you can communicate to your therapist and, you know, a lot of therapists have the best of intentions. They're just trained in really bad ways. Sorry. Um, to be so blunt, but that's basically what it is. And so if you can connect to their intention and their, their desire to help you um, try to connect with that part, I know that that makes the client do all the work and that's not fair for the client. But if you tell the client, tell the therapist, can you go get more training in dissociation? There's so much training out there with dissociation for the ISSTD. We have, so, we have a huge educational component to what we do. It's basically our vision, vision and mission statement. Um, finding me, I'm very Googleable in Calgary, Alberta, cannibal, cannibal, <laughs> Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, I have a small private practice where I have three other individuals who work with me who I have trained myself. Um, so they, they come from the same understanding philosophies and principles that I do. Um, some really good books that, a good place to start is a man named Bessel van der Kolk wrote The Body Keeps the Score that really does talk about how trauma lives in the body. That's a kind of, and it's, he's, he's written it so well that most people can, can work their way through it. My book is, um, if you, if you want to read my book, I'm not telling people to go buy my book because that makes me uncomfortable. But if, if you want to read my book, um, I, I'm trying to, you know, go in chunks because I really try to describe how we're supposed to be and then how it goes wrong and then how to try and, and get it back. But I, I do that because this capacity to be internally loving and caring and externally loving and caring is part of our hardware. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I start seeing clients, I would say, I don't want you to trust me. You're not supposed to trust me. I'm a stranger. However, I trust your body. A hundred percent, I trust your body, which means I trust that everything that you are doing is an attempt to survive, if not heal. Because the body, if it's in survival mode, it has one agenda. If it's in a healing agenda, it, a healing mode, it's in a different agenda, right? So the, the survival system is really designed to keep you alive or to keep you not dead. <laughs> the other brain structures are um, designed to enjoy life to make this life bearable and full of love and hope and that really is in our our brain structure so i trust that that's in there too wonderful. wonderful yeah i love that oh my goodness i i could talk to you for hours and and i think we're gonna have to have you come back on to to talk about the meditation that you've created for folks because i really do want to dive into meditation for folks who disassociate because it's so common to for folks to come into my practice and tell me I can't, you know, I can't meditate. And, and I know that there's a disassociation going on with that. Unfortunately, I have to go jump on yep. a plane to fly back to Washington state today. And um, so my goodness, I love this. Thank you so much, Christine, for coming on and we will get you on again so we can yes. talk about meditation. Yes, because that's a very important thing because it's really, really popular right now and it actually kind of is kind of, it can be hurting a lot of folks. Absolutely. No, yeah. let's do it. We're going to talk about it, folks. Stay tuned. We're going to get Christine back on. We're going to talk about meditation and we are going to dive deep into that one and we will, will to be continued here. Thank you. Hey, Health Junkies, Dr. Janine Krauss here. I hope you enjoyed my podcast. Guess what? I have a Facebook group. It's called Anti-Aging Health Tips with Dr. Janine Krauss. So if you want a little bit more of the Health Fix podcast, head over to my Facebook group and let's chat. Now I'm also offering a health transformation and restoration program. It's a one-on-one -on -one with me. And it's for folks who are sick and tired of going to doc after doc and health coach after health coach and not seeing the results that they want and deserve. In my program, I'm working with folks with transformation. So this isn't just a light program. This is a big deal. I'm going to change how you think about your health and your life kind of program. And I'm super excited to offer it to folks. And if you are at all interested, we should talk. I'm offering 45 minutes free with me chatting to see if and how I can help you. And you can get all the details over at my website, drjkrausnd.com. All right. 
you've survived another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. Subscribe, rate, and share info. 